Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 3, Cybersecurity Terminology. In this lesson, I'm going to identify a few vocabulary terms that we use in cybersecurity, and I'm going to tell you a few stories that use those terms. We find that the best way to learn new words is to use them and to listen to other people using them. So that's what we're going to do here. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the vocabulary we're going to discuss in this video can all be found in chapter 1 of this book. Check out pages 6 through 11 especially. If you're not using this textbook, don't worry about it. Just follow along with the lesson. Here's a list of the vocabulary words that we're going to cover. Don't be intimidated here. We aren't asking you to memorize all of this just by watching this video. We find that the best way to learn new vocabulary is to encounter the words over and over again. Right now, we're just trying to provide some initial exposure to these words. Now, the first story I'm going to tell you is true. It's about a journalist named Matt Honan who was hacked by an anonymous cyber criminal. You can read about it in more depth at Wired.com. The story there is titled, How Apple and Amazon Security Flaws Led to My Epic Hacking. And this isn't a typo, by the way, he spells Matt with one T. Okay, I'm going to tell the story now. You should just follow along. Pay attention to the vocabulary words. As they come up, I'll highlight them for you. In August of 2012, hackers erased all of the data on Matt Honan's iPhone, iPad, and MacBook. Among the data lost were Honan's daughter's baby pictures and Honan's digital copies of old family photographs. The hackers also accessed Honan's Twitter account and tweeted a number of inflammatory, homophobic, and racist messages. They also deleted Honan's Google account, including eight years' worth of messages from his Gmail inbox. This attack compromised Honan's information on all three levels of the CIA model of information security. The hackers compromised the confidentiality of Honan's information when they accessed and viewed Honan's private, password-protected digital accounts. They compromised the integrity of Honan's information when they made unauthorized changes to it. These unauthorized changes included deleting his files and, in the case of his Twitter account, posting illegitimate messages. And of course, they compromised the availability of Honan's information. When the hackers changed Honan's passwords, he was locked out of his accounts, rendering his data temporarily unavailable. Even worse, when the hackers deleted Honan's data, they made it permanently unavailable. Or at least they attempted to do so. In the article on Wired.com, Honan expresses optimism that some of his information is recoverable. So, how did these hackers carry out this attack, which was both personally devastating and ultimately childish? Some of you may find this surprising, but these attacks were carried out without writing a single line of attack code. They required no special computer programs, nor did they require any particularly impressive technical skills. A script kitty, that is, a hacker with no significant programming knowledge, could have easily pulled off these attacks because the only tools necessary were a web browser, a telephone, and personal information about Honan that was available to anybody with an internet connection. If you want more details, you'll have to read the whole story on Wired.com, but I'll give you a summary of how the attack went down. Here it goes. The hackers began by collecting all of the personal information about Honan that they could collect from Honan's social media accounts and public records that were available online. They got Honan's email address, physical address, and other bits of information, and they used that information to crack Honan's Amazon account. How did they crack his Amazon account, you might ask? Well, it was surprisingly simple. The hackers called Amazon, pretended to be Honan, and asked the Amazon representatives to reset Honan's account for them. The hackers used Honan's personal information, along with the clever use of a fake credit card number, to convince Amazon's customer service that the hackers were really Matt Honan. With access to Honan's Amazon account, the hackers were able to collect even more personal information about him. Most significantly, Amazon gave them the last four digits of Honan's credit card number. They used this information to crack Honan's Apple ID, which gave them access to Honan's Apple devices. How did they crack his Apple ID, you might ask? They used the same basic trick as before. They called customer service at Apple and used Honan's personal information to convince them to reset his Apple ID password for them. Once they had access to his Apple ID, 
They had enough information and enough access to his accounts that they could run a password reset on his Google account. So they reset his Google password and logged into his Google account. They used his Google account to collect the information they needed to log into his Twitter account. And finally, they used his Twitter account to post offensive and embarrassing messages. To cover their tracks, the hackers deleted Honan's Google account and they used his Apple ID to request a remote data wipe of his MacBook, iPhone, and iPad data. Ironically, this remote wipe service from Apple is intended to protect users from cyber criminals. It allows a user to remotely request that their data be deleted in the event that one's laptop, tablet, or phone are stolen. The hackers in this story took advantage of several security vulnerabilities. While some of these vulnerabilities were beyond Honan's control, one of the primary vulnerabilities was Honan's own fault. He had linked several of his online accounts together in such a way that access to one account could grant a hacker access to all of them. Honan admits that the attack would not have worked if he had taken care of the vulnerabilities that were under his control. Honan wrote an article about his experience for Wired.com. In the course of writing the article, he was able to make anonymous contact with one of the perpetrators, who explained the method that they had used to attack Honan's accounts. In cybersecurity terms, this method of attack is called an exploit. Once Honan knew this exploit, he and his peers at Wired.com tested to see if they could recreate the attacks in a controlled setting. They were successful several times, and if they had wanted to, they could have mounted malicious attacks of their own. Since then, Amazon and Apple have insisted that they have updated their customer identification protocols to eliminate the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. So we can hope that these exploits are no longer effective. In his write-up of the story, Honan points out that as bad as the hack was, its impact could have been much worse. Had these hackers been cyber criminals who were driven by profit, they could, they could have easily used his email accounts to access his online banking information and ruin his finances. In a way, Honan was fortunate. If Honan's attacker wasn't driven by profit, what did drive him or her? Well, the hacker Honan exchanged messages with claimed that he was a hacker activist, a hacktivist, and that his motivation was to spread awareness about computer security. He also claimed that he had help from another hacker, and he claimed that his helper was the one who was responsible for deleting Honan's data and his Google account. What do you think? This particular hacker claimed that he is really one of the good guys. Is he? Did he perform a valuable public service by hacking Honan's accounts? Okay, now that we have an idea of how that attack went down, let's perform a little informal risk assessment. As you may have already read in the textbook, in the language of cybersecurity, risk is the combined measure of all the vulnerabilities, threats, and potential impact of cyber attacks for a given system. But what do these words mean exactly? If you already read the textbook, you might remember that vulnerability is a security term for describing potential weak points in a security system. Threat is a security term for describing the likelihood of a given attack. Impact is a security term for describing the consequences of an attack. And as I said, risk is the combined measure of vulnerability, threat, and impact. So let's pretend for a moment that you use the same gadgets and accounts that Honan uses, and let's pretend that Apple and Amazon have not yet fixed the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. If that were the case, how could you lower your security risks? Well, one way would be to reduce your vulnerability to attack. Honan points out that he would have decreased his vulnerability if he had enabled two-factor authentication on his Google account. Those of you who've used Gmail might be familiar with two-factor authentication. Every Google account is protected by at least one factor of authentication, a password. With Google, users have the option to require a second factor, a unique single-use code which is sent to your phone. Two-factor authentication dramatically reduces vulnerability. It's much tougher for a hacker to get your password and access your phone than it is for him to just get your password alone. Another way to reduce risk would be to reduce threat, or the likelihood, of an attack. Honan's threat of attack was naturally higher than yours probably is. He's a public figure who is known for writing online magazine articles about cybersecurity. 
These factors made him an enticing target for hackers. A relatively anonymous internet user like you or me is probably less likely to be targeted by hackers, at least by hackers who are interested in glory. As a rule of thumb, consider this. The more that people stand to gain from attacking you, the more likely you are to be attacked. This means that high reward targets face increased threat, which translates into increased risk. Finally, we might reduce risk by reducing the potential impact of an attack. For example, Honan's attack would have been much lower impact if he had backed up his daughter's baby pictures on disks or on an external hard drive, or on some other data storage device. If he had backups, he could have recovered more easily from his epic hacking experience. Well, good. I see that I was able to use most of the vocabulary words from pages 6 through 11 of the textbook in that epic hacking story. The only terms that I seem to have left out are nation-state, zero-day exploit, and malicious insider. I'll tell you another story, and I'll make sure to use those three terms in that story. I'll make this one shorter, though. The following story, a story about a cyber attack that was probably carried out by a nation-state, is based on a profile that ran on CBS's 60 Minutes in 2012. The story goes like this. In June of 2010, a small security company in Belarus discovered a computer virus programmed to attack Siemens brand industrial control systems. An industrial control system is a computer that controls big industrial systems, such as a factory floor or a citywide electrical network. Industrial control systems are relatively small in size, but they do a lot of work. They direct most of the equipment in large facilities. Most factories, power plants, and other such facilities that you know of probably use some kind of industrial control system. This particular virus became known as Stuxnet. As security professionals analyzed Stuxnet, they made a surprising discovery. Though Stuxnet would infect many Siemens brand industrial control systems, it would only attack one of them. That's not to say that it would only attack one kind of Siemens system, mind you, but it would literally only attack one particular computer in the entire world. The only computer in the world that Stuxnet, Stuxnet was programmed to attack was the industrial control system at a particular uranium enrichment facility in Iran. Stuxnet infected many systems, but it would only attack this particular facility. The remarkably specific nature of Stuxnet, combined with its jaw-droppingly complex attack code, has led many pundits to speculate that no ordinary hacker is responsible for Stuxnet. Many people have reasoned that it must have been developed by a nation-state, most likely the United States or Israel, but maybe both. Of course, no government is taking responsibility for Stuxnet, and if it is indeed a government operation, then all records of it are top secret. What does Stuxnet do? Security professionals have determined that when Stuxnet found the right computer, it was programmed to make the computer accelerate the rate of rotation for some motorized centrifuges. That's equipment necessary for the enrichment of uranium. Stuxnet would also make the computer display incorrect data on the centrifuges so that the plant operators wouldn't see that anything was wrong. The overacceleration would damage the centrifuges, but the plant operators would attribute the damage to bad materials rather than to overacceleration. In order to write such specialized attack code, the Stuxnet programmers required intimate knowledge of the Iranian plant. A security expert interviewed in the 60 Minutes report claimed that the authors of Stuxnet probably knew the power plant better than the Iranian operators themselves. For this reason, some have speculated that a malicious insider may have leaked information about the plant to the programmers of Stuxnet. Did Stuxnet work? Nobody knows for sure, but it had a good chance because it was a zero-day exploit. That is, the attackers found the vulnerability before anybody else knew about it. Also, the plant that it was designed to attack did replace somewhere between 1 and 2,000 centrifuges. So, based on this circumstantial evidence, many security officials have concluded that Stuxnet probably caused the damage that it was designed to cause. That's all of the stories that I have for you for now. I hope that they have helped to familiarize you with some of those new security terms. 
If you have any trouble with learning the vocabulary in this class, the best advice I can give you is to just be patient. As long as you keep reading things that use this language, and as long as you look up the words that you don't understand, you will pick them up eventually. You just have to use them to learn them. In the next video, we're going to begin exploring the inner workings of a computer system. Now, we obviously cannot go into too much detail about such things. You could spend a whole lifetime studying computer science, so we'll keep things pretty basic. But if you understand some of the basics about how a computer works, you'll be better able to understand how cyber attacks work, and therefore you'll be better able to understand how to defend yourselves against them.